We begin the program tonight in the Horn of Africa, where it's been another week of rapid developments in the peace process between Ethiopia and Eritrea. A week in which the Eritrean president, Isaias Afewerki, reopened his country's embassy during a historic visit to Addis Ababa. And a week in which flights resumed between the two countries for the first time in 20 years. The bitter standoff between the former foes has left many families separated from each other. But as Emmanuel Ligunza reports from the Eritrean capital, Asmara, now transport links have been established. There's new hope. <laughs> Ethiopian journalist Adi Salem Hadgu is meeting his Eritrean wife and children for the first time in 16 years. It's an emotional moment for the family that, like thousands others, has been torn apart by a bitter border dispute between the two countries. Adi Salem is among the first people to be reunited with their families following the landmark peace deal between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Can you imagine spending 16 years in darkness? For me, it was 16 years of darkness. Think about it. Now the darkness has been removed and I was able to see my wife, my children, and meet my grandson. It's like winning a lottery without buying one. Leaders of the two countries recently signed an agreement to end two decades of the dispute that has claimed tens of thousands of lives in the late 90s. After years of strained relations and mistrust, diplomatic relations have now resumed and economic ties re-established. Across the capital, Asmara, these two flags continue to fly side by side, a constant reminder of the events of recent weeks. This new peace deal signed between Eritrea and Ethiopia has brought hope to a country that has been isolated for years. And people here believe the country's fortunes are about to change. My feeling is, uh, it's a super feeling as I had it. You know, I've been looking for this for many, many years. If, uh, if this peace um, uh, starts to bubble, uh, so that the Horn African countries will, their development will be high, everything will be good. That's my expectation. We will see more developed and more uh, powerful Horn African countries by this peace. The conflict with Ethiopia has defined so much of the politics and life in Eritrea. Rights groups are now urging the government to use the newfound peace to bring about democratic changes in the country. Everywhere there are problems, uh, but the political goodwill is there uh, and those problems will, will be addressed. But you need a conducive environment and uh, in the last 27 years I think the main focus was to overcome the existential threats that, that we are facing. We are not looking for justification to, to violate human rights. That's, not, that's incompatible with uh, the whole ethos of the of the liberation struggle. So human rights is part and uh, was and is part and parcel of our liberation struggle. So that's not an issue. That's not a controversial issue as far as it is concerned. The political commitment. While the enthusiasm here in Eritrea is evident, many are wondering now to what extent the fast pace of the peace process will affect the political and economic situation here in Eritrea. Imano Ligunza, BBC News, Asmara. So as Emmanuel mentioned there, the sweeping political reforms in Ethiopia are exerting pressure on Eritrea to follow suit and end years of repression. Many see this as an opportunity for President Isaias Afewerki to end his country's isolation, but he must make far-reaching changes. There are five key areas where activists are calling for reform inside the country. Eritrea established a constitutional commission in 1994. It was ratified in 1997, but after the war broke out in 1998, has never been implemented. Religious freedom, Eritrea also um, only recognizes four religions, Orthodox Christianity, Sunni Islam, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Eritrea. All others are considered illegal. National service was introduced in 1995. The length of time served became indefinite in 2002. It is now one of the main reasons forcing young people to leave their country. And the release of political prisoners, thousands of people have been detained by the Eritrean government without trail. There's also the introduction of free media. In 2001, the government closed all private newspapers, the only media operational in Eritrea today are all state-run. 
Well, joining me here in the studio is David uh, Mesfin, uh, writer, researcher, and political analyst who campaigns for human rights and democracy in Eritrea. David, are, are you surprised by the rate at which things are moving, the speed? Well, I'm, I'm very, very surprised. In fact, I'm more surprised that the Eritrean government accepted the peace initiative that was accorded to it by the Ethiopian leader. So, uh, once it had been, uh, it, it was declared, uh, many of us were very skeptical uh, and, and we wondered whether the government would uh, respond positively and it did. Why do you think Ethiopia offered this olive branch? I mean, this has been 20 years where they say they were not going to accept the uh, Boundary Commission's ruling that, you know, the territory they were fighting over belonged to Eritrea. Eritrea became isolated over that. Why do you think Ethiopia offered this olive branch? You see, we always uh, think that it was Eritrea that was suffering. Ethiopia was also suffering from... from uh, uh, n not accepting the UN uh, ruling. But there was a, a rivalry between the factions, the, the Eritrean government uh, versus the T TPLF uh, regime, which was uh, uh, ruling Ethiopia for the last 27 years. So once that uh, change appeared on the political scene in Ethiopia, the Ethiopians uh, were quick to... Uh, realize what happened and and they wanted to rectify it. Mm. you see the ruling was accepted by Ethiopia in principle but there was a condition attached to it indeed and, and, and this it's fair to say that this is Eritrea coming in from the cold it's been isolated for a very long time now do you th think this relationship change is just towards Ethiopia or towards the rest of the world well, yeah, that's a <laughs> tricky question. What, what happens, what is happening now is something which hasn't been addressed uh, by many uh, uh, news outlets is the reason Eritrea is responding the way it is responding. Mm. The reason Ethiopia is acting uh, towards peace. Why? You see, the, right in between them, there is... Uh, uh, a big region uh, called Tigray, which is part of Ethiopia. Mm. Eritreans have uh, a score to settle against the, the Tigray regime, which ruled Ethiopia for the last 27 years. And then the Ethiopians, especially the Amhara and the Oromos, they also uh, were not happy because the, the reign of the uh, Tigrayan faction went far too long. So both are ignoring Tigray at, at this moment. And Tigray is closer to Eritrea. Mm -hmm. so, and, and, I, I mean, I just want to comment because I have a couple more questions that I want to yeah. ask you, I mean, time willing. Yeah. Um, it, the issue of conscription, yep. it's compulsory in Eritrea, it but now the war is officially over. Will it still continue? Well, it's not supposed to continue. The reason why we have the, this national service and an endless conscript, it was because of the threat of war. Now we don't have that threat. So... This variable, which, which uh, created so much chaos in that formula, is not there anymore. And, and have you been talking to people back home in Eritrea? Have they told you that since this thawing of relations between these two old enemies, that life is beginning to change within the country? Well, yes. Uh, psychologically, it, it has made uh, a big change. People are happy. I mean, the euphoria in Eritrea is, is amazing. I, myself, who was a skeptic, began to believe what is really happening. Mm. Because I had a chance to speak to an 88-year-old woman whose daughter has been uh, in jail for the last uh, 17 years, a former fighter. So she was happy. She was humiliated. Absolutely. And, yes. and as, as well they should be. I mean, yeah. David, I could yeah. keep on talking to you about this for the whole evening, but I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. David Mesfin, thank you very much for coming into the studio today. Thank you.